I got a call one day from a guy from Montreal. He said, we have a four layer board, power and ground in the middle, EMI problem. I, he said, management's willing to go to six layers. What would you do? And I said, I would do this in six layers, still have two signal layers. And it w completely got rid of their EMI problem because the power was now delivered through five different dielectrics instead of, you know, one uh, dielectric. The signals all had a reference to ground and so on and so on. This is not a cost effective design because there's only two signal layers. This is just not a great idea. If you, if you need to save money, this isn't going to be a good plan. This is a six layer board that I absolutely love. I mentioned the people with the analog circuit that had the accelerometer problem where the, where the amplifier was, was being interfered with. This is the six layer board they went to to solve it. They only needed three signal layers and they went to this to solve it. Now, the first time I did this, I was concerned about the imbalanced construction. You know, Robert, that the fabricator needs balance in their construction to build the board. And when I first did this, I was concerned about it. That's why I poured the power on layer one, layer three, and layer five to even out the copper on all the layers. And I sent the Gerbers to them and I said, before you even build this, tell me, is this gonna be hard to build? And they said, no, not at all. Because every layer looks like a plane mm -hmm. because of all the copper you have. Mm -hmm. And it worked wonderfully. The beauty of this, all the power pores are referencing ground. All the signals are referencing ground. If you have to change layers from layer one to three, you don't need a ground via. If you change from three to five, you don't need a ground via. But if you go from one to five, you do. That's the only time you'd need a drop in a ground via. So if you're changing layers from layer one to layer five. And what about bottom layer components? We just pour ground around them. Okay. I, I've done this a lot. Now, people say to me, this can't be easy to design. And the answer is, oh, heck no. Hey, it's you've, got sig you've got signals referencing a ground pour on the bottom of the board. And you have to route the signals above the ground pour. You can't route those signals be just above the pins of the, of the components. It's really, you have to really be careful where you route stuff. Otherwise, you're going to develop a problem. So I'm not going to tell you for a second, this is an easy board to design. But people who want low layer count boards, this is how to get a low layer count board that is magnificent in its behavior. This is a four layer board, typical four layer board. In 1995, I was still in the aerospace industry as before I went to the telecom world. <clears throat> and we had an EMI problem with a board just like this. Um, it was in a product that was really inexpensive. It had to be a low layer count board and it, it was the only circuit board in the product. So when we had an EMI problem, we pretty well knew what was causing it. It was this circuit board. <clears throat> we talked about how to solve the problem and we weren't sure what to do. We believed at the time that part of the problem was that all of our signals were routed on outer layers and we were having fields escaping from those layers because they were outer layer routing. We later realized we were wrong, but that's what we believed. So we decided we needed to route the signals on inner layers. So we unrouted. All I did was disconnect the signals from all of the components. I left them routed, and I simply moved them to layers two and three of the board. We then said, okay, well, we've got signals on two and three now. How are we going to do this? The beauty, they were already routed around the components because they had been routed on layers one and four, mm -hmm. and they had to be routed around the components. So none of these signal lines routed under a component. So we poured ground on the top and bottom of the board, and of course it poured around the components. So now all of the signals were referencing ground. Unfortunately, we still had not distributed power. And we started talking about how are we going to do this? We have no place to put a power plane. And I started playing with it and realized that if we could pour power on the signal layers, and if we could make those power pours 
overlap each other between layers two and three. So we could put vias between the points where they overlap, that if we could get enough power pour, we could make all of the power connections that needed to be made, and they would all have a low impedance reference to the grounds on one and four. We completed the design, and it really wasn't that hard to do. Yes, it was harder than the design on the left. Let's be honest. It isn't our job to make things easy. It's our job to make them work, right? We had to have a four-layer board, and this is the one we ended up using. We got a 15 dB improvement in our EMI signature. We lowered the EMI signature by 15 dB microvolt per meter. So this may, this may be the reason why when you have Elgon some PCBs, they have ground on top and also on the bottom because yes. they, for example, would like to use less layers in this stack up and then they have to do it. And sandwich stuff between those grounds. And that's what makes people believe that just pouring ground on top and bottom lowers EMI. Well, because they doesn't. think that it shields. The... Yes, they think of it as a shield. It's not a shield. Mm -hmm. It's a reference for signals and power. Mm -hmm. and, and in this case, ground on top and bottom was the right thing to do. In the case of Lee's board, he, oh, come on. Here, in the case of Lee's board, ground on top and power on the bottom was the right thing to do. Because it generated... Power ground, power ground, power ground. In the case of this four layer board, we were able to solve the problem with ground on top and bottom because power was on two and three with the signals. In that case, ground on top and bottom was the right thing to do. Um, these are other four layer stack ups that work well. This only works well if you have low component density. Obviously you can't put components and signals and power on the outside of a dense board. This just can't be done. Here's another one that's basically the same, a little bit higher density. The advantage of this, it allows the signals on layer three to be strip lined. So if you have really sensitive signals you want to bury in the board, you can route them on layer three, and this will help a lot. So, you know, both of these, there is no four layer stack up that's wonderful, as you well know. There is no, gosh, isn't that great? Four layer stack up. They just don't exist. It's four layers, you know? You can only do so much with it. Um, this, for just one second, you ask about two-layer boards. Yes, it was one of my... If you put signals on layer one of a board and have a 1.6 millimeter thick, 1.52 millimeter core in the board, a 62 mil thick board, <clears throat> with ground on the bottom, the impedance of those signal lines is going to be anywhere from 70 ohms to 140 ohms. And they're going to change because as the signals go high and low, the fields from them are going to impact each other. So if two signals next to each other go high at the same time, the fields are repelled. And that raises the impedance of both lines. If one of them goes high while the other stays low, the fields are attracted, and that lowers the impedance. So you have very poor impedance control on a two-layer board with a ground plane on layer two. Very, very poor, unless you put grounds between the signals. And again, attach those grounds with lots of is. Now you've got impedances with a solder mask that are anywhere from 60 to 80 ohms. You still get some, you still get some effect of things changing because of cross-coupled fields, but the effect is much, much, much smaller. Anyway, here's a better two-layer board because it's got a thinner dielectric. Yeah. This will be a 31 mil thick dielectric with a, uh, a 31 mil board with a 29 mil, which is a 0.75 millimeter FR4 core. And this is a common dielectric, this is a common core. Any fabricator can get this core from their supplier at no extra cost. So if you use flex PCB, is it going to be better? Because flex PCBs are usually very... Are very thin, thin yes. Flex PCB will be much better. If you have a two-layer, if this was a flex board, you probably wouldn't even need the coplanar ground on layer one. I've designed a lot of flex boards that were two and three. And Now, 
That's another thing. Flex boards can be odd layer counts, as you know. FR4 boards, rigid boards can't have odd layer counts. They have to be even layer counts. Because if you make a three layer board, the fabricator is going to charge you for four layers. If you make a six or seven layer board, they're going to charge you for eight. That's the way it works. Because they have to start with eight layers and completely remove one of the layers of copper. There is no such thing as an odd layer count board in the rigid world. Flex world is different because they stack the materials together when they make the board. So they can make a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, a six, anything you want. And yes, in the flex world, we did a lot of in the avionics designs that we had. We had a lot of controlled impedance flex boards that were two and three layers. And they worked magnificently well. <clears throat> we put an amplifier. We, <laughs> we had an accelerometer in the aircraft that sensed pitch, roll, and yaw. It was a three-axis accelerometer. And it had three outputs, one for X, one for Y, and one for pitch and roll. And it sensed all three movements. And we fed that into an amplifier circuit, amplified the signal, fed that to an A to D, and then into the digital circuitry. Those signals sometimes got down into the microvolt region. And we were able to put them on a three-layer flex board that was ground on the top, ground on the bottom, and signals in the middle. And that thing worked perfectly with a 24-bit A to D converter with no noise problems. Think about that. I think flex can be even like thinner than like normal oh, yeah. PCBs. Oh, it, it, you can have it a mil thick. When we talk about this flex, when you do these planes, I think in flex you need to use net. Or you, you can you can have cross hatch planes. Uh, that's what I you, mean. Yeah. Or you can have a solid plane. Oh, okay. It depends. See, it depends. <laughs> It depends on if the board's going to be constantly flexed, you need to use a crosshatch plane. Otherwise, you'll fatigue the copper and it'll, it'll crack. If it's a board that's going to be flexed once and then stay like that, you can use a solid plane. Okay. And that's what we used to do in our avionics product. We would use crosshatch planes. So people then say, well, you can't control the impedance of a crosshatch plane board. We'll say, yes, you can. Impedance will be a little higher per given dielectric and trace width, but you can certainly control it. You might have to make the traces a mil or two wider, you know, a, a, a mil. What's a mil in millimeters? It's 25 microns. You might have to make the trace 25 or 50 microns wider, but, you know, so what? Oh, here's a board, and I'm not going to say who the company was. <clears throat> But there's an extremely well-known IC company that said in their application note, this was for a microprocessor that had 1,300 pins. It was a 1,300 pin BGA. And in their app note, they said, we understand that some people for cost reasons need to have a low layer count. They said the lowest layer count we could route this processor on and get everything routed out of the processor was an eight layer board with four, four signal layers. And here's the eight layer board we used. And I can believe, I can truly believe that the, I know the processor had a lot of on package and on die capacitance. So I can believe power delivery worked okay with this board because of that. And I can believe that signal integrity was okay. But I can tell you with clarity, they did no EMI testing. This board could not, would not pass EMI testing. Why? 